It really is a pleasure to be here at Stanford. It's a partnership that uh, Xerox has felt uh, very positive about over the years. And uh, particularly, I have to say, between the university and our Palo Alto Research Center, which is just a few miles away where I was this morning, and some uh, certainly very distinguished graduates from the B School, Barry Rand being one of them, who rose to be a top executive um, at Xerox as well. So for a lot of reasons, it's great to be here with you today. And um, I have about 45 minutes, not even. And what I really like to do are four things. And what I've been asked to do is four things. To talk about the past, and um, not just to tell the story, but most importantly, to talk about the lessons learned along the way. And uh, there were many. To share a few thoughts on leadership and particularly leadership at a time of crisis. Um, and then describe um, what I do, what's a typical day, <laughs> and talk a little bit about just the you know, priorities and how I spend my time, and most importantly, leave plenty of time to take your questions. So, so I'll get to it. Um, and as Bob mentioned, um, in 1998 and early 1999, Xerox seemed to be doing very, very well. Market shares were improving, um, our stock had risen and, quite frankly, was outpacing the market by a wide margin at that point in time. We had made a change in leadership, brought in a CEO. It appeared to be doing very well, and uh, so most of us were kind of had our set sight on a fairly bright future. I was actually running um, an independent startup company that um, Xerox had um, focused on to really develop the Soho market and desktop products at the time. So I think uh, it's fair to say that with alarming speed, things began to unravel in late 99 and 2000. And they unravel with alarming speed, but the problems generally take place over decades, so important to, to note. Um, but we had also taken on a massive reorganization. It did not go well. Um, competition was stiffening big time, and we were focused on inward kinds of issues. And then at that point in time, economy started to weaken around the world as well. That was when we actually discovered accounting improprieties in Mexico. And that actually spread into a worldwide SEC investigation, one of the first of this decade. Um, I often say we were early adopters of the corporate crisis. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I'd have to say that we took some actions that in the uh, broad daylight of hindsight were just strictly dumb um, at the time. So we actually captured it and called it the perfect storm. What else could go wrong? Um, and I think it would be fair to say that this is a company that could have managed through a few of these issues, but the cumulative impact really overwhelmed the company and set it back on its heels. So by May of 2000, we were in deep trouble. Um, revenue and profits were declining. Um, our cash on hand was shrinking. As Bob mentioned, $19 billion of debt. $150 million of cash, and I could not find the $150 million of cash. It was scattered around the globe. And uh, so customers were not happy. We had employees who were defecting, who certainly uh, didn't want to, to be a part of a company that was uh, heading south. Our shareholders had seen the value of their stock cut in half and continued to head south. And then there was this little matter of an SEC investigation that had spread around the world. Um, this was about the day I was named president and chief operating officer. And typically, um, in a talk like this, where you'd say it fulfilled a lifelong dream, and that was not the case. Um, <laughs> this clearly was a case of um, a responsibility that I have to say I accepted with equal parts of uh, pride and dread. Um, but I very quickly figured out I had two really important aces in the hole. The first was a customer base that actually treasured the Xerox brand wanted Xerox to survive, so people who were willing to work with us during this difficult period of time. And the second was an incredibly talented and committed workforce who would do just about anything to save the company. And so we really did roll up our sleeves and begin the hard work of uh, addressing all these issues. And I'd have to say in the beginning, um, most of that time was spent listening to employees, to customers, and uh, industry experts and customers told us we had great technology, but our responsiveness had slipped incredibly. Our industry experts told us that we had a lot of great technology, but we better make some clear choices and focus as it related to uh, our market opportunities. And employees told us that they would do whatever it took to save the company, but we better provide clear direction and do it quickly. So we laid out a pretty bold plan. Um, didn't really. Uh, 
qualify as taking a rocket scientist in terms of what had to be done. The first piece was to f fix the liquidity issues very, very quickly and uh, raise cash both through you know, some asset sales as well as uh, incredible management of all cash sources. We had to restructure the cost base. It was very clear to me we had a huge cost base problem. Um, so we set a goal of taking a billion dollars out, knowing that it wasn't sufficient, but that uh, we would strive to take the billion dollars out as quickly as possible just to begin this process of competitiveness. And the third leg was one that was really important to the Xerox team, and that was is that we would actually strengthen our core business, actually invest in our core business at the same time as we were restructuring the company and fixing the liquidity issues. So the results really have been um, fairly stunning based upon the challenges that we had. Um, on the liquidity front, um, you know, we really raised about $2.5 billion of cash quickly, but we took a lot of tough actions. We outsourced our office manufacturing. It was a union shop. We exited our small office, home office business, a business that I started, and we focused on operational cash generation with a level of discipline and focus that uh, was just extraordinary. And on the cost front, we took out the first billion, then we uh, started on the second billion. We're actually taking out our third billion now. Um, we reduced our selling and general and administrative expenses by over 25%. We cut our capital spending in half. And um, the most painful thing, we re reduced our worldwide employment by about a third. And when you have an experience like that, um, you really stay focused on making sure that you have a business model that's sustainable and uh, can really support the cost and the infrastructure going forward. So, um, but as much as uh, I think uh, we did some dramatic things, reducing our debt, um, our debt's been cut in half and what's left is just uh, kind of the customer receivables. We improved our cash position. Um, we've had great cash generation, about a billion and a half per year. We have three and a half billion dollars of cash on hand. As a matter of fact, during the SEC investigation, um, we had basically lost our financial staff and uh, we had no CFO in the company, so I was acting CFO and um, had to manage through the SEC investigation. But um, when I finally hired a CFO after we had resolved the in investigation and I said, you know, I've been acting as CFO and, you know, I'm, I really don't have a sophisticated financial background here and I'm really anxious to hear you know, what your thoughts are on our cash strategy. And he looked at me and he said, hoarding would be the, the strategy for cash. <laughs> and it was quite appropriate. So um, as proud as I am of the financial turnaround, it is the progress on the third leg of the strategy. We didn't take a dollar out of research and development. Um, we have both, we have four research facilities around the world. We spend about a billion dollars on research and development. And as a result, the past couple of years have been our biggest product launch years in history. Um, and I'm really on firm footing when I tell you we have just an incredible portfolio of innovative offerings and solutions for our customers that are combinations of um, extraordinary hardware, software, and uh, also our, our people. Um, so it's good to be looking at a set of uh, positive results. Um, everywhere we look, uh, fortunately, the trends are going in the right directions. Our margins are where we want them. Um, just this year alone, we took $3 billion off of our uh, balance sheet and um, our equipment sales, which is really the driver of our company going forward, have been growing for the last seven quarters. And most importantly, we're winning in the marketplace. Customers are voting with their checkbooks. So this is just to give you a perspective on uh, where we've been. I, I think it would be fair to say that a few years ago, people were writing our obituary and now uh, we're getting some, some very nice quotes, like, uh, like really looking at a, a great turnaround. So this has been really, I think, the opportunity of a lifetime and certainly a thrill. And I think the, the biggest understatement would be to say that I've learned a lot along the way. And that's what I'd like to um, turn to now. And as we reflected on it, there are really 10 areas that are basic. Um, certainly nothing uh, terribly brilliant, but they seem to get lost in the shuffle when you um, are going through an experience like we have. The first um, is, I kind of characterize it as look before you leap. Um, as Bob said, I'm a lifer, 28 years at Xerox. I really know the place, and uh, I have to say that when you've, when you've grown up in a company, you think you know all the answers, and um, if you couple that with uh, some fairly... Uh, in, intense decision making, which uh, I'm noted for, it can be a pretty dangerous uh, combination. So fortunately, 
I was slowed down and uh, spent probably the first 90 days on planes just listening to employees and customers and um, just anyone who had a view on what the problems were just to make sure that we would be addressing the core problems and not just addressing the symptoms of the problem. And it turned out to be quite a different list than the list that I had uh, originally anticipated. And I have to say that um, we were in a position where everybody was kind of putting out fires but not fixing the fuel leak that was uh, causing the fire. So it was really an important uh, part of the exercise, taking the precious time that was required to really understand what the issues were in the company. And I'd have to say, if we didn't go through that, um, I think I'd be giving a very different talk today. The second is really about communication. And it's always important, but in a time of crisis, um, it is absolutely the single biggest priority that you have. And actually, that's when people tend to go underground, when things are ugliest. And uh, this was uh, a really important part of the turnaround strategy. I, I have to say that I, I worried a lot, and I had a lot of doubts. Um, but when I communicated um, with all of our constituents, constituencies, I was pretty transparent about the size of the issues. Um, I used to call it the brutal truth and give people uh, a sense of really what was happening in the company, but also confident about um, a plan that would overcome those issues and uh, the combination of hopefully giving people a sense that we really do know what's happening here and it's not good. And we have developed a plan that will address those issues was really the, um, the approach that we used. And I think our employees really uh, appreciated that. And my message was always pretty consistent. You know, here's the problem, and here's the strategy, and here's what you can do to help. And to this day, if you ask Xerox people about the turnaround at Xerox, they will tell you what they did <laughs> to turn around the company because there was just an incredible alignment of people around saving every dollar, taking care of customers, really trying to make sure that the company uh, focused on the priorities. And we asked them to make a choice, roll up their sleeves and go to work, or quite frankly, leave Xerox. And, um, and I think that was just a hugely important uh, exercise for everybody to make that conscious decision. So fortunately, the response was really quite positive, And um, we really started to retain all of our people and started to make a lot of um, progress as it related to uh, the turnaround. So when people ask me how we accomplished so much so quickly, um, I always um, am quite uh, clear in saying that uh, you have to have a good strategy. It can be roughly right, though. And a good plan is important, but it is in big companies. It is the alignment of your people around a common set of objectives. That is the single advantage to being big. <laughs> to have alignment and scale and use it um, constructively to really accomplish your goals. Otherwise, quite frankly, then it is a disadvantage. The third um, lesson that I learned was about crisis being a, uh, a powerful motivator. It enables you to do things that obviously you should have been doing all along. And um, I think that uh, in this case, I probably wouldn't have set a goal of taking out a billion dollars immediately. Um, had we not had this window of uh, opportunity um, called a, a crisis, and uh, certainly in the past, a lot of those kinds of efforts would have been met with a lot of resistance. But given the crisis, no one uh, could argue it was either a billion dollars or it was the gallows for Xerox. So that was really hugely important in terms of taking advantage, moving quickly, getting things done quickly while you had this kind of powerful motivator across the company. Since then, not to lose the intensity of this focus on competitiveness and being best in class, um, we've been deploying Lean Six Sigma in the company, which is a way to kind of create systemic productivity improvement throughout the company. And it's, it's a marriage of the speed and simplicity of Lean tools with the, the, the rigor and the discipline of the uh, Six Sigma tools. So this has given us a process and a language and a toolbox to address really tough problems, problems that have been around this company for decades. And uh, I have to tell you, it's been a great partnering tool. We, we partner with a lot of our customers, providing them with black belts and resources to solve their productivity issues. And it's created an enormous value for us as a company. This year, Lean Six Sigma will bring $160 million of profit to the bottom line in Xerox. So, and we'll double that next year. So we, are, um, we have an army of uh, 
trained resources throughout our company. I'm a green belt, and uh, I have to say that it's been an enormous help in maintaining the intensity of constantly staying ahead of the productivity curve. But I think the point is, is that we're, uh, we've taken out a lot of that cost without harming the core business, and in many ways it's made us more efficient. Um, it's increased our clock speed. It's removed a lot of the bureaucracy, and, uh, and that's why it's hugely important to kind of maintain that focus on productivity and competitiveness for companies like Xerox. Fourth is, um, I kind of call it back to basics, and um, you're very often uh, intrigued by, and, uh, and it's tempting to think about uh, quick fixes and new ideas. You get a lot of help, too. There's a lot of people who have great ideas that uh, certainly want to help, but in our experience, a lot of the answers really were about getting back to basics, simple things. Xerox had an incredible heritage and quality, one that we had uh, lost, putting discipline back in all of our processes, aligning our people around objectives, lots of tough and regular operations reviews, and a lot of strict management of the usual things like you know, inventory and gross margins and capital. And, it's amazing how quickly that discipline can unravel in a company, and it's uh, not trivial to build it back. Um, so processes that had taken years to develop kind of lost their way overnight, and, um, but the good news is, is that they, they can be built back, and they are clearly the only way you can run a business to deliver predictable results. Fifth is um, an interesting one, because I, I kind of call it following your instincts, and we are an incredibly data-driven and process-driven company. But after you get the data and after you listen and your open-minded um, instincts based upon good management experience play a big role in moving quickly and making decisions. Um, we had actually had a ton of consultants in, in to Xerox over the 90s who helped us kind of organize along many lines. We, had, we were organized by industry, we were organized by product, we were organized by segment, we were organized by geography. And as I was making my initial travels around the world, I was looking for anybody who felt any degree of accountability for anything. And uh, man, it was just me. It was scary. And uh, <laughs> so despite what looked good on paper, um, we unraveled it. And it's not perfect, but it's clear. And I can look people in the eyes, and I know what they're accountable for, and you can hold them accountable for it. And it was a huge enabler for us to make operational progress. The sixth is about cl corporate culture, and it's kind of gotten a bad rap um, lately. As a matter of fact, uh, when I was making my initial rounds, I was visiting a big customer and a new CEO um, for a bank. And he was coming in with kind of a turnaround charter and uh, wanted to give me um, a lot of advice about what needed to be done at Xerox. And we owed him a lot of money, so I was listening. <laughs> so uh, <laughs> in any case, uh, he said, you got to kill the culture. It's the, the culture in this company that has made it you know, sluggish and bureaucratic and you've lost your, your edge and your competency. And I was listening, but I have to tell you, uh, I realized it was kind of nonsense. What is a culture other than the collection of people and behaviors that you have within a company? And it's a great way of pointing out, uh, you know, it's your problem uh, to the people of a company. And Cultures clearly needed to be adapted. Ours needed to gain a lot of speed. We needed to do away with some things, but you have to bring the culture with you if you want to get things done in a big company. And it was hugely important that we really built on the strengths of the Xerox culture to enable us to do what we had to do. And our culture puts a premium on things like quality and empowerment, results, diversity, fairness, customer, corporate responsibility, things that are really, uh, people are proud of. And uh, quite frankly, it's the reason a lot of people came to Xerox and why a lot of us stayed. So if it helped us achieve greatness in the path, in the past, hopefully it can be a path for the future as well. Seventh has to do with focusing on, uh, on customers, never forgetting the reason custom that, that companies exist. But when bankers are calling and shareholders are knocking on the door, it's really sometimes easy to lose sight and forget the most important constituency of all, and that's the customer. But I have to say that we decided as a team that that would be um, our number one executive focus, that we would own customer relationship. So we all took key clients and uh, went out and uh, really personally communicated to our key clients, solved problems, addressed issues. 
we've kept that program, which we call our focused exec program, but it's hugely important and it's built into the fabric of our company, but just to ensure that every single person, I'm talking the chief accountant, you name it, has responsibility for a set of customers that they visit with, and not only is it great for the customer to get the kind of um, you know, senior attention that's required, but it's great for our executive team because it provides them with that grounding principle of what our customers are thinking, and it's really been hugely helpful. Eighth is um, something I call the vision thing, and um, I guess the, the best parallel is, is that even when Rome was burning, people wanted to know what the city of the future would look like, and I have to plead guilty that I didn't immediately get that part. Um, I would do lots of town meetings, and I was always amazed that the most frequently asked question is what Xerox would look like when we came through the turnaround. And I'd be sitting saying there, why aren't they asking me, are we gonna make it? <laughs> are we gonna survive? Yet they were beyond that. They were kind of, a, if we're gonna roll up our sleeves and we're gonna be dedicated and we have a passion about this, I wanna make sure that I'm working for a company that'll be a great company and not just a company that survived. It was a very good sign and certainly a, a great example of the resilience and optimism of Xerox people. But I'm not very patient, I have to say, with uh, the vision thing and vision statements and all that. So we decided to do something a little different and um, probably our biggest critic at the time and uh, where a lot of the ugliest headlines uh, were uh, present was in the Wall Street Journal. Every day you'd pick it up and there was some uh, horrible uh, story about Xerox. And so we decided to write a fictitious Wall Street Journal article dated in 2005 that would really describe where Xerox would be in 2005 with all of the elements, if you will, of strategy and metrics and goals and, um, and opinions and feedback. We, we had quotes from you know, analysts and uh, from our toughest critics and, uh, and we basically, it forced us to kind of express, express our vision and our strategy in, in, in plain English and you know, we talked about everything from you know, what technology we'd be bringing to market to what the revenue growth would look like and um, and how we'd like to be seen. And it was incredibly useful. Pe people really rallied around <laughs> this vision. And um, to this day, no matter where I go in Xerox, that article comes out. And I'd say, fascinatingly, 80% of it um, probably is pretty accurate. And I get asked about the other 20% all the time. And, um, you know, well, when's this going to happen? And I said, like, Hello, we made it up. <laughs> it's not going to happen, and uh, <laughs> and it's that's how people felt about it at the time. It was just an extraordinary thing. So um, ninth is about good critics. Um, I like to think about myself as being open and approachable, but um, I have to say that um, this is an area where when you rise in the ranks, so all of a sudden uh, people around you want to please, they're a little, a little bit more respectful, a little bit more intimidated. And you have got to make sure that you have sources of honesty and critique available to you. It's something that you have to work at. You can't leave it to chance. Um, it's just hugely important. What it allows you to do, and it's such a gift, is to actually um, ensure that you're able to deal with problems early. <laughs> And when they, you know, fester in the environment, they're bigger and bigger, and eventually, uh, clearly, they become crises. So it's it's truly a gift. Last thing, and uh, we'll talk then a little bit about leadership, but um, it's about sense of humor and perspective, and um, you know, not to forget that part of what you makes work so great is is that you enjoy what you do, you enjoy the people that you work with, you laugh a lot. Um, and you have this kind of relationship and community that um, becomes awfully important to a satisfying work experience and um, taking yourselves too seriously, even with the dire problems that we had, um, would have been a big problem. Um, we had to laugh at a lot of mistakes, we made a lot of mistakes, we laughed at ourselves, but um, I don't believe any of us would have survived the past four years if we didn't um, truly look forward to coming to work every day and um, huge goal for everybody. So when I talk about leadership, I, um, I'd like to just say I think everybody has read so much about leadership and certainly I had been in lots and lots of roles um, where I led teams and um, you learn about it, you read about it, but until you come face to face with the impact of leadership, uh, I have to say I don't think you can fully appreciate it. 
And with that, I would tell you that poor leadership can do damage overnight. It's amazing the uh, extraordinary damage that um, poor leadership can do. And really good leadership can move mountains over a longer period of time. It's got to be consistent and uh, certainly uh, takes a lot longer time to make progress. I actually read a book from one of your alma maters who actually had a big impact on me and it was during a really important time and it was, the, it was good to great. And, it was about companies that had um, extraordinary results over a long period of time. And then, of course, then a, a research project to analyze what were the common set of attributes for these really great superior companies. And, um, and only a few companies really met those standards. But the not so surprising answer, of course, was the um, quality of the, the leadership. And, um, but here's what was surprising, that these leaders were almost unknown. <laughs> They weren't the household names, and that they were this kind of paradoxical blend of personal humility, but an incredibly strong professional will. And um, they really focus on building teams, giving credit to others, doing whatever it takes to make their company great, but it is about their companies, and it's not about themselves. And it's just um, sounds very logical um, that if you focus on the institution, your contributions are far more likely to be lasting ones, but, um, but one that may have eluded us, particularly during the period of the 90s. So um, last but not least was, uh, how do I spend a day? And I'm glad to say that there is um, no such thing as a typical day. And uh, whether it's a crisis or an opportunity or circumstances change or you know, stuff happens, uh, it's really uh, certainly not typical. So I thought I would actually just tell you what, I do, what I'm going to do and I have done this week because it should be pretty typical. But I actually started in my office on Monday morning. We have a board meeting next week. It was my last time in the office. So it's um, so a little bit of uh, time just for preparation there. Then I actually um, flew to Washington to meet with a very large customer. And then I spoke to the senior management meeting of another very large customer, actually Fannie Mae, in, uh, in Washington. As you know, they're going through their own version of uh, a corporate crisis, so uh, so they had an audience that was real interested in uh, in, in hearing uh, what the Xerox experience was, and then I flew out here to San Jose um, all day um, yesterday. We met with our Fuji Xerox colleagues. We have a equity partnership with Fuji Xerox. It's how we distribute um, in Asia Pacific. We also have a technology and development exchange with Fuji Xerox. So we met with our uh, senior team there and had dinner with them last night. This morning I met with uh, our our employees at our Palo Alto Research Center, and then a customer meeting, and then my visit here this afternoon. Tomorrow we have uh, 3M in for a day for an executive exchange on the topic of innovation. We're hosting it at Park, um, but it should be a, a great half day. And then I fly to Clearwater, Florida, where I'm meeting with the CEO of Tech Data, our largest indirect distributor, and uh, I'll actually speak with their senior management team, and then finally tomorrow night, uh, return to, or Friday night, return to Stanford. So the good news is, is that it's a week out of Stanford. <laughs> so I travel most of the time because that's where the work gets done, that's where our customers are, and that's where Xerox people are, which is really the, the core of what I do, is meet with customers and Xerox people, um, the most important constituencies. So, um, so that's probably pretty typical. So um, my last message is, by the way, that um, if you uh, believe in communications uh, being as important as I do, I, I, my title should probably be Chief Communications Officer because that's a lot of what my job is about now. And if you listen as much as you talk, it's time well spent. It keeps you grounded and connected to the marketplace, to your customers, to your people, and um, gives you just an invaluable source and rich set of information. So in any case, hopefully I've given you some food for thought and I would be delighted to open it up and take your questions. So the question was about characteristics and of work ethic and um, what served me well, perhaps, in uh, attaining a CEO position. Um, I guess I begin with um, I'm I'm a pretty intense worker in the sense that um, I I I don't like any idle time. So I'm I'm generally um, try to get a lot accomplished in a short period of time. I actually think that came from or hopefully a skill I developed being a working mother. <laughs> I think having um, children while I was working 
um, always put boundaries on my work life so that um, I wasn't going to stay at the office for 14 hours a day. That wasn't my shtick. I wanted to get home when I was home and have dinner with my husband and my kids. So the ability to accomplish a lot in a short period of time became for me the most important um, work ethic. And it's kind of stuck with me. Um, I'm a early riser. I go to the gym every day because um, it's for my head just to kind of start the day with, uh, with a fresh uh, perspective. And um, I stop working. <laughs> if I'm in Stanford at 6 o'clock, I don't stay rarely any longer. I have lots of dinners now and lots of other, but, um, but I do have this belief that um, you need space from work to have perspective and, um, and you have to make that space available for you. Work will consume as much as you will give and that's clearly the case. And, and I should also um, reflect back in the 2000, 2001, I worked seven days a week, 24 hours a day, just because that's where the company was and there just wasn't any space. But um, that's not the characteristic of my career. And I'm now, I think, back in a place where you know, there's a little bit more balance. But you have to make it. No one gives it to you. And I've always been pretty tough on creating boundaries about my work day. And it's really been helpful, um, I think, both in the sense that you seem to get more accomplished when you have those boundaries, and it also, I think, is a much more rewarding life as well. Yes? Did you not see a need for an MBA in your career? <laughs> <laughs> this is an interesting one to answer. <laughs> probably would have gotten an MBA along the way. Um, but that wasn't my plan. And um, you know, I, I must tell you that uh, you know, I started out um, in sales at Xerox, and, uh, which clearly at that point in time didn't require an MBA. And um, it just never, um, you know, then I had kids. So the trade-offs in time became uh, really difficult uh, to make those kinds of sacrifices. And uh, you know, when I weighed the commitment against my own ambition, <laughs> um, I'm not sure my ambition measured up to uh, to get um, you know really just the additional uh, training that clearly would have been helpful. But I would tell you this: um, I have uh, had to make up for. Not just not having an MBA, but also not having a lot of the training in a company that I run um, by an incredible amount of intense learning on the job. So, you know, I was acting CFO during one of the most complicated restatements in American business. And uh, I learned from every resource I could find um, as it related to um, financial training. So. I probably got there in a very non-traditional way in terms of learning, and it probably would have been nice to have had that head start in the background and the experience um, through an MBA. But um, you know, it, it just wasn't in the cards when I was uh, starting my work career, and uh, I never made the trade-off from from that point on. So it probably was just not uh, something I planned for. Yes. Often we hear from CEOs who are men who um, credit their wives with get, not only getting them to where they are in their career, but giving them a full home and family life. I'm wondering what role your husband played and if he was balancing a career of his own and how you manage that, that juggling act. Well, we always talk about the fact that we both need wives. <laughs> <laughs> years. He's retired now, okay, for three years. So, so the great news is, is that I'm not sure I could have pulled this job off without having, you know, full-time support at that point. Um, and my kids are older now, too, so it's a little bit of a different situation. But I'd say we, we, the last 25, the first 25 years were constant um, trade-offs with regard to, uh, you know, certainly both of our, our jobs and careers. Um, I think we've made some decisions that were really important for us. If we both we both wanted careers, neither one was willing to kind of say, um, "I come first. 
we've fought that battle <laughs> for years, and as a result, we made this agreement that we weren't going to relocate for the benefit of the other's job, that tough, turn it down, that's not the shtick that we were on, that we really needed to have kind of an, a feeling of um, importance with regard to what we did, and, um, and that we would turn down some other opportunities uh, so that we didn't have to kind of displace the other person. <laughs> Um, and we also decided that uh, we also actually had this great goal to be good parents, too, that uh, was um, certainly not the easiest of things during those years. So, um, you know, this thing is always about choices. And um, I think you get into trouble when you don't make clear choices. Well, we made clear choices. And that was work and kids. That's it. So uh, I, when I first became CEO and they were putting together kind of my, my personal history, and uh, they were picking up all this stuff from my resumes. I had to stop them because I knew it would be published. I said, I made all that stuff up. <laughs> I didn't do any of those activities or hobbies or... <laughs> And uh, for a long time, that's really all there was room for. So I think we made it work because we made an equal kind of sacrifice in terms of you know our free time and what we spent it on. And um, there was for us, and it's not for everybody. There was no particular resentment about kind of this you know I come first scenario. It just wouldn't have worked for us. Yes. Could you talk more about how you address the employee morale issues when you were laying off a third of the workforce? Yeah, it was huge. I think it was the toughest, um, toughest thing we did. I should say that um, we did everything we could um, to save jobs, um, even if they weren't Xerox jobs. So when we uh, negotiated an outsourcing arrangement for manufacturing, we forced the transfer of at least um, a third of the manufacturing employees with the outsourced contract so that we could save as many jobs as possible. We outsourced our back office operations to GE Capital. They took all our people. Um, so right there, you know, we had, um, you know, several thousand employees who were working, not for Xerox anymore, but um, we did a lot through managing attrition and retirement and trying to manage down uh, the ranks as, but at the end of the day, Obviously, we shut down businesses. We made a lot of tough decisions. Uh, so probably the best example is, is that I shut down the small ho office, home office business that I started, 1,000 people. And um, you know, there's only one way that you can do it um, and at least give people a sense of um, that you care and that you do it face to face. And uh, so that was our rule that um, we always did it in person. And um, met with the organization so that it was never delivered uh, indirectly. Um, you know, we had a we had a context for it, which was a corporate crisis. So it wasn't like this was, you know, just by desire. It was by necessity. So I do think that um, you know the context of you know having bankruptcy rumors in the papers every day built a little bit of more sensitivity from the employee population about the decisions that we were making. You know, it was it was a survival kind of thing. Um, so all I can say is is that you know, you certainly have to build an honest, incredible story about what you're trying to accomplish and what you're trying to do. You got to deliver bad news face to face and um, take the tough questions and own up to the decisions that you're making. And then you got to work really, really hard um, to convince people that you're trying to put together a company that isn't going to go through this drill over and over again. And that's really what we've been about, is, um, is really the kind of adaptability and sustainability that a big company needs so that you don't go through that kind of, um, you know, wretching disruption that huge restructurings cause. It's one of the main reasons why I'm so passionate about Lean Six Sigma, because it's a, it's a problem-curious discipline <laughs> that forces you to deal with issues before they get big. And, um, you know, and that's why I, I want our people so engaged in it, so that they help solve them, they fix them. We don't let this problem um, develop into something that has to be done um, you know, in, a, in a really harsh way again. So I think uh, people know that we suffered through this and uh, that 
we try hard to, I think, make as many um, decisions as possible about um, saving jobs. But at the end of the day, and I, I used to have um, this conversation with our union, it's um, no jobs or less jobs. I mean, there really is a reality about what we were dealing with that um, you couldn't perfume that big. It was just absolutely <laughs> essential that we told people the truth about um, what was going on. So no easy answer. And uh, I still think the organization bears scars. I, I feel blessed with people that are loyal and terrific and love the company, but it definitely scars a company. And it's no way to run a company, that's for sure. In the back. Can you talk a little bit about it? About the leadership team you assembled and that you put together to deal with the crisis, and um, if you could um, maybe focus on whether you kept the team intact as you went through the process of reorganizing. Okay. Well, when I came into the job, it, um, I knew that there would be certainly um, some people that probably weren't thrilled with the decision that uh, I'd become CEO of Xerox. So the first thing I did was sit down. Um, it was a 12 member team, and I sat down with everybody and kind of did the same thing I did with employees, which is, you know, no time to waste. I can't be looking over my shoulder. You know, if you sign up, um, you know, you have to be signed up totally. Otherwise, I'll make it really attractive for you to leave. Because I can't waste any time with people who don't buy in and care about, you know, the corporation the same way, uh, same way I do. Three out of 12 left. And I did, I made it very attractive for them to leave so that, um, you know, they, it clearly wasn't, um, you know, they could own up to the fact that they really didn't want to stay. And uh, that was a good thing because it happened quickly. And if there's one thing I've learned throughout my career that, um, you know, the quicker you deal with those things, the better off you are. So I brought in some new people and made a lot of changes also within the team, but wound up then with a 12-person team that's still with me today. Um, some of them in different roles, but um, they've all stayed. I think the part that people don't appreciate, um, it was obviously a very difficult time at Xerox, very tough decisions, not a lot of rewards and recognition either. Right? You couldn't really buy your way through this one because there was no money. But <coughs> the feeling of accomplishment when you can contribute something that really has an impact is enormous. And this team feels this extraordinary sense of participating in the last three or four years and having this huge impact of putting a company back on its feet and um, bringing back a, you know, kind of a brand icon to profitability and stability. So I think the satisfaction of what's been accomplished has been a huge retention vehicle for this senior team. And, um, and we're like a family, <laughs> you know, it's, uh, really does create an environment where um, you develop some very, very close relationships. So I feel really lucky to have uh, this team in place. Here. Uh, was there a point of time in that general run when you thought that we're gonna we, we weren't going to make it, like we're going to fail? Or, and if you went through that situation, how you shared that or you did with your <laughs> Well, there were a lot of points in time. I, uh, you know, uh, certainly um, knew what the odds were on these kinds of things, and um, and certainly our odds were not good of succeeding. And um, I often think one of the things that was happened to be a good thing at the time is is that not having been trained, if you will, and groomed to be a CEO, um, there were a lot of things that I took on that probably, um, you know, I didn't have the. <laughs> if you will, the, the perspective of someone who'd had the experience and gone through it. And I think it kept me perhaps a little bit more in the dark and a little bit more optimistic about the possibilities. Um, you know, one of the things that we did, I mean, we, we negotiated us. Um, we lost all of our commercial paper and drew on a line of credit at $7 billion. That's the 58 banks that um, we negotiated with. And I had to meet with these 58 banks every 30 days and basically kind of report an update. And at the end of the day, we had to get all 58 banks to sign on a renewal um, within 24 months because it was an expiring line of credit, or else it was, you know, the whole line wouldn't renew. So we would be bankrupt immediately. And um, I had some serious doubts about whether or not we would be successful with that. 
I think that was probably the loneliest part of the job is, is that um, you don't get to have those conversations with many people. Um, you get to have the conversation about how difficult things are and try and put a realistic perspective, but you have to balance it with the fact that we can, we can get there and we can do it and keep people engaged and motivated. So I'd say that was um, one of the things that probably was most difficult was just um, lots of nights kind of lying in bed and thinking about uh, you know, the security of all these people that was at stake if we weren't successful with some of the things that had to be done. And, um, you know, I, but you don't, I think, it's the first time in my life that I wasn't in a job with lots of peers, people that I could kind of talk to and hang out with and uh, share concerns or be a critic. And, uh, you know, <laughs> that guy's stupid. And <laughs> So um, that was a learning experience for me, I have to say, and one that um, took its toll, I'd say, during the first couple of years because it did require kind of an internal uh, mechanism for dealing with the stress of uh, some of the situations, and um, it was a tough time. There was one over here and then there, yeah. You mentioned before that it's important to find sources of honesty and critique, and I'm wondering where did you find those sources? Were they internally, externally, and how did you solicit that kind of... Well. The ones that are most helpful to me are usually employees and customers, because um, they really see um, what's happening. So, you know, there's nothing more sobering than going to visit um, a really unhappy customer about, um, you know, what their experience has been and what the problems have been. And I, I, I did a lot of it. I do less of it now because we have less, hopefully, unhappy customers. But, um, but getting that first-hand feedback and dealing with the frustrations and the issues first-hand, I think, with the marketplace is really important. Um, inside the company, it's actually easier than you would think. Um, there's constituencies that are very outspoken. Um, we have, you know, 8,000 technicians who, uh, who are on the streets every day solving technical problems, and they're not aspiring to be CEO. They're like... Let me tell you what's wrong with this company. <laughs> and uh, so a lot less political overhang in certain constituencies if you uh, create an environment uh, where they can uh, speak freely. And um, we, we do tons of business with like agent partners and people that see Xerox from arm's length and it gives them a freedom to provide input and feedback that's hugely important. So. There are tons of sources. I think the real key is, is that you actually have to thank people and make them feel valued for giving you the feedback versus shoot them. And uh, that's the first instinct you have is defense. And um, you have to just kind of learn to absorb it and take it away and know that it's a gift and, uh, and process it and deal with it. But um, they're there to be had. You just have to create the environment. Yes? same company for 28 years. How do you go through these times? And I mean, is uh, sticking with the same company is, is something you would strongly recommend? <laughs> <laughs> so um, it was probably one of the most important um, reasons why I could do what I did at Xerox. Um, this is, you know, it, it was a lot more emotion than it was logic, probably, in terms of a lot of um, the effort that we put in. Um, at the time, it was um, very, very, uh, it was not well accepted in the market. If you read the, the headlines on May of 2000, it would have actually been very, very negative because the conventional thinking was is that when a big company runs into trouble, gets into a crisis, um, what you need is literally an outside turnaround expert who can be somewhat ruthless and quick and solve the problems and um, get it back on its feet and then you can turn it over to uh, a more sustainable team or something. But so it was not well received. It was not the day that I was announced as CEO, I think the stock dropped 15%. <laughs> not a big confidence builder. <laughs> so, <laughs> builds character, that's right. So, um, so no, but I, when I think back on it, um, you know, it, it was so hugely important in terms of developing the loyalty and the relationships and building the team and um, I had such a head start because of what I knew about the place what I I was one of them <laughs> and um, I really felt that um, you know the culture was hugely important that there was there had to be a pride and a respect and a relationship about how we did this so that people could hold their heads high 
And, and that's not to say, by the way, I'd say a third of my team is hired from the outside. So this is not a requirement, but I think for this particular set of circumstances, I viewed it as a tremendous asset. And um, I think that you know, there's always going to be a mix in companies of people who stay <coughs> for long periods of time and, um, and those that you, know, you bring in for external perspective and groom at different points in their careers. So that's, that's a good thing. But I have this goal, and I know that um, it used to be, and it maybe well, it, it's in vogue to say, you know, you kind of have to build this portfolio of experiences to, you know, really develop your career. I want to hire every Xerox person with the goal of making it a place they want to stay for a long time. And I actually want them to come with that same motivation that they can see a way that this could be a place they'd love to have their whole careers. It may not work out. <laughs> But I think both company and individual are served a lot better if that's the motivation for joining a company and hiring an employee. So I'm sort of trying to instill that into the fabric of the company that you know we really would love to have people stay and be with us and have careers that are really fulfilling for long periods of time. In the back, and then here. What keeps you up at night now? Well, I think the thing that probably um, I, I'm a worrier by nature, and uh, so I will always find um, something to be concerned about. But, you know, I, if someone asked me what motivated me more, success or failure, I would probably say failure. And, um, you know, I think that's one where I, I, I run really hard <laughs> to avoid failure more than I run towards success, I think. And therefore, I think um, it almost makes me nervous that um, we're at a place where people kind of think it's business as normal, you know, business as usual. Um, so it's trying to not put our feet up and, um, and fall into some of the characteristics that I think um, got us into trouble in the first place. And having a level of intensity it's a different goal, okay, we're about growth and greatness now and not just about survival, but you need, I think, that same level of intensity and passion um, going forward and that's, that's a big challenge to try to sustain that. Um, you know, I, I tend to think that uh, right now crisis was a more powerful motivator than <laughs> perhaps, uh, you know, the goal to being a great company again, and um, that's my job. I've got to make sure that that's in place, but it is something that uh, certainly worries me that, that this next stage of the journey um, is one that I've really got a whole different set of things to accomplish than the last piece of it, and um, equally important. So, pretty, pretty challenging. Yes? it had been a competitive advantage for Xerox for so long and then you saw the need to realign it. What advice do you give to other companies that are in similar situations that there, that there needs to be some culture change, change um, but yet it is so important for the success of the organization? Yeah. So, you know, I generally say you've got to find the good, the strengths, the competencies and the strengths and the value system and cultures and, and really use it as um, your North Star so that people feel this sense of um, we're not just a big company, we actually stand for something and a lot of that's embedded in the culture. So identifying that and calling it out during times of change I think is just so important. And for Xerox it was all about um, you know, our community involvement and um, I mean we did more probably community volunteering in the last four years than we did in the previous 10 because we really focused on the fact that that is part of what we're about as a company. And that's why this company has to be great again. And um, we didn't, we have a foundation and you know, we continued to use our foundation for that kind of thing. So identifying that core set of things that you can use for grounding while you go ruthlessly after the things that really have to be changed, I think gives people a path that they wanna come, they wanna follow. And I believe kind of the definition of leadership is followership. <laughs> and that that's what you have to create, something that people feel proud about and that they want to participate in and want to be a part of. And that's, I think, how you have to break down culture so that you can 
deliver the change, but give people a sense of pride and ownership in history and reputation that I think is uh, a big part of what keeps people around. So, well, thank you all for participating on your day off. I appreciate it. Thank you.